Maybe you're not enjoying what God promised because you're not saying what God said. We're going to talk about confession next. The program you are about to watch is part of a free series we are making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries entitled, Saying What God Said. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s and watch the streaming video for free by entering code FREE at checkout. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, I'm Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. We're doing a series called Saying What God Said. We're looking at confession, the subject, the topic of confession, faith confession, and we're looking at it from Scripture. And one of the things that started me in this study was I was wondering years ago, is it really that important what you say? Is that really something that we should be concerned about? And as you study the subject of faith, you realize that confession is, is half of faith. Uh, faith is made up of two parts, believing in your heart and saying with your mouth. So in order to do faith properly, we've got to get this confession part down and understand it. So we're talking about some of the uh, abuses of confession and how not to use it. Uh, it's not a magic wand. It's not something that's going to manipulate and control other people. But this is for you. Your tongue controls your life and your surroundings. And your faith has an impact mostly on your life. It certainly can affect others, but... We're looking at it from a personal perspective. We want to uh, pray the prayer of faith for ourselves. I don't want to have to depend on somebody else or wait on somebody else to do my praying for me or to receive from God for me. I want to receive from God by faith myself. And so uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to understand confession because you can undermine your faith with the words that you say. Now, we have all of these uh, lessons outlined right here on our study notes. You can go to the website and get these study notes. We're really dealing with four points when it comes to confession, and they're all in these study notes. Uh, the four main points became very clear to me. If we can answer these questions or, or, or um, make these four points, you could understand the subject of confession. Number one, faith speaks. That's what faith does. And if it's not speaking, it's not faith. Number two is, does it really matter what you say? And we're going to answer that question in these sessions. Does it really matter what you say? Doesn't God know my heart? Does it really matter to God what I say? Is it important? We're going to look at that issue. And then the third point we're going to make is, you have what you say. You don't have what God says. The Bible says, Jesus said, if you believe in your heart and say it with your mouth, you'll have whatever you say, Mark eleven twenty three. 23. So it's very important that we realize that we have what we say, not what our neighbor says and not really what God said. And it, and it doesn't even say you have what you believe. Jesus said you have what you say when you believe it. And so that's an important point. And then we're going to, uh, complete this teaching by talking about saying what God said, how to say what God said. In my opinion, this is what balances out the whole teaching of confession. If you're saying what God said, you're on safe ground. You're not going to get weird or extreme or far out. You're going to be uh, on very safe territory if you're saying what God said. And the secret of faith is to believe the will of God or the word of God. And to complete that process, then you end up saying what God said. So the Word of God gives you the basis for faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And you stand on a scripture or a series of scriptures that promise you a certain thing. You believe that in your heart. And then you say what God said. You say what those scriptures mean to you. And we'll talk about how to do that and how that's done in a practical way. In fact, we're going to get into some of that today if we have time. So I want to begin here, uh, and let me mention this, for all of the, uh, the downloaders and the streamers, we have all of these teachings, all 15 sessions, in audio and video called Saying What God Said. Go to my website and go to the free download section, and you can stream all of these, uh, all of these videos or you can download the audio immediately. They're all available right now on our website. 
I want to begin in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and this is the uh, story of the woman with the issue of blood. Let's start in verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians, and she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I'll be made well. And I talked to you on the last episode about how I use this principle in healing meetings all over the country. As I did healing, taught on healing and prayed for the sick, I would have them say for two or three days, when hands are laid on me, I'm going to receive my healing. And I got it from this experience, this, this woman in Mark chapter 5. She said, if I only touch his clothes, I'll be made well. She, and, the, and the Amplified Bible says she kept saying, she kept saying. So you see all the elements of faith here. She heard about Jesus. She believed what she heard. And she confessed. She spoke. And she got what she said. She didn't get what her neighbors said. She didn't get what somebody else thought or said. She didn't necessarily get what she thought. She got what she said. She said, if I may touch his clothes. She kept saying, if I may touch his clothes. You need to keep saying what God said. Keep repeating and keep confessing God's word. Don't allow your, uh, your confession to contradict what God said in his word. Uh, it's counterproductive. It will undermine your faith. It will ruin your position. So our confession needs to be consistent. Once we pray the prayer of faith, once we take our stand, our confession must follow that up and it must be consistent. So she, she kept saying, if I only touch his clothes, I'll be made well. That's where her faith was. She had obviously heard of people who were touching Jesus' clothes and being healed. In fact, uh, I looked it up and it happened prior to this incident. We have examples where Jesus went and everyone who touched his clothes were made whole. Obviously, she heard about this because she believed that, that if she did it, she would receive. But she didn't just believe it. She said it and she kept saying it. It's so important that as you uh, determine that you're going to receive from God by faith, that you keep your confession consistent. This is the one variable that, um, that, that we have where it comes to faith that can really get off the rails quickly because it's so easy to go from saying what you believe to saying what you feel. And sometimes we're so focused on our feelings and what we see that um, we've got that hooked up to our tongue and we're, we're constantly reporting what we see and what we feel. The, the circumstances that surround you, that hem you in, will not change as long as you're confirming them with your words. The way to get out of this cycle is to begin to say what you believe. Say what God said. If you're going to move that mountain, you've got to speak contrary to the mountain. You can't keep acknowledging the mountain and confirming the mountain. You've got to speak to the mountain. You've got to change the things that you uh, say. Uh, let me read this to you. Now, now we know what happened. Uh, this woman touched Jesus' clothes and power went out of him and went into her and healed her. And um, he didn't even know she was coming. He didn't know she touched him until after the fact. And he looked for this woman and he says, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. He didn't say, Daughter, I felt sorry for you. God the Father has, has seen your suffering and he's decided to move in your behalf. No, he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. And as we read this account, we see that she's the one that determined when and what she would believe God for. She did it. Nobody else did it. That's the beautiful thing about faith is you can decide this. Nobody gets in your way. Nobody will stand between you and God. You can believe God for whatever you want to believe him for. But we must follow that up with the words that we speak. And I'm going to give you more and more proof of this because I don't expect you to believe the importance of confession just because I'm telling you this, just because I'm telling you it's important. We need to base our beliefs in the Bible. And that's what I did years ago. I really wanted to know 
Does it matter what we say? Doesn't God know our heart? Isn't it good enough if my motives are pure and, and my heart is right toward God? Isn't that enough to, to, to have God move in my behalf? And I studied it with an open mind, and I wanted to see the truth about confession. Because honestly, I thought faith preachers and faith teachers were making too big a deal out of it. I thought maybe it was just a little bit too legalistic that God really knew everything and, and you know, he would work it out one way or the other. But that just didn't line up with scriptures. Let me read this to you from a faith preacher, a faith teacher, Kenneth Hagin. Uh, I wanted to read his, uh, this quote from one of his books. He said, There is no faith without confession. Confession is faith's way of expressing itself. Isn't that a good way to put that? If, if faith is going to express itself, the number one way is going to be confession. Faith, like love, is of the heart. There is no love without word or action. You can't reason love into people and you can't reason love out of them. It's of the heart. Faith is of the heart or of the spirit. There is no faith without confession. Faith then grows with your confession. And I, I, that's the point I wanted to make with the woman here. Her faith grew as she kept saying. By the time she got to Jesus, she had said it and she believed it and there was no doubt about it. And I, like I said, I've seen, I've seen that in my own meetings when I've had people say, I'm going to receive my healing on Tuesday night. When they say that Sunday and Monday and all day Tuesday and they get there Tuesday night or Wednesday night, whatever the case may be, they are totally convinced that they are going to receive that thing that they desire. And, and, and their confession played a, 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 a huge role in that. You know, if, you're, if your faith is wor not working and the prayer of faith not working in your life, check this area of confession, especially if you don't have a problem believing the doctrine. If you love the doctrines of the Bible and you believe that God does miracles today and you believe that God wants you to have victory and Jesus paid a price for your healing and, and to provide for all of your needs, if you believe all that and you don't have a problem with that, and yet your faith is not working, look at what you're saying. Look at your confession because it may be, uh, it may be betraying you behind your back. Sometimes we don't realize what we're saying day in and day out. And we feel like we're totally justified in saying the things we feel and the things we see. But when they contradict what we're believing God for, then it works against us and not for us. He says, faith then grows with your confession. The confession of the believer does several things. First, it reveals your position, spiritually and naturally. So if you were to take inventory of all your words, not the words you speak on Sunday when you go to the altar and pray with the pastor, but what are you speaking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? What are you speaking all week long? That reveals your position. More than a walk to the altar and a, and a short prayer with the pastor. What you're saying during the week really is what reveals your position spiritually and naturally. Second, it sets the boundaries of your life. For you don't receive from God beyond your confession. Uh, those were the words of Kenneth Hagin. And, uh, and, you know, that is so important to, to hear and understand what he said there because... These principles work for anybody. God's not making it difficult. He's not making it out of some people's reach. Uh, we can all do this, and it's important that we see th that, that, um, that we can. Jesus paid the price, and he did all the work. So we're just receiving what he's already provided by faith. The point is, the fact is, that confession is part of faith and you just can't get away from that if you're if you're truly honest about what the bible says and the scriptures you just can't get away from the fact that confession is a big part of faith let's go to james chapter 2 and uh, i want to get into a couple of things that james says james had a lot to say about confession in the tongue but we're going to just look at this one today james 2 14 he says what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? 
And, uh, and when he says works, in the Weymouth translation says it this way. What good is it, my brethren, if a man professes to have faith and yet his actions do not correspond? Can such faith save him? N no, the answer is no. Uh, you can't just have faith in your heart, a quiet conviction in your heart, and get saved. Your actions have to correspond. And one of the greatest actions that corresponds with faith is your words. You, you can't truly have faith without words. And, and you can take it on further and say also deeds. But words come first. You, you don't have faith without corresponding action. And in many cases, the things you're believing for, the best and only action you can take is to follow up your faith with your words. So our words qualify as corresponding actions. In fact, he's talking here about salvation. Now, we know that works don't save people. So he's not talking about having faith and then going out and earning your salvation. But what he's saying is you can't have faith in salvation without some kind of corresponding action and get saved. We find out what that corresponding action is in Romans 10. We could start in verse 8. So what we're talking about here is faith for salvation. How does faith for salvation have corresponding action? And how, does it, how is it received in the life of, of a person? How do you get it? Well, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So the, the word of faith, faith itself, is in your mouth and in your heart. Isn't that powerful? Th this is a two-part system. In, and he's saying here, you can't get, James says, can, can faith alone save you? Uh, can you just have faith in your heart that God is, is real and that Jesus died for your sins and be saved without any other action? No, because here's how faith works. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the faith that's in your heart is vitally important. We're not downplaying that at all. But to complete it, to release it, to have corresponding action that actually receives salvation, you've got to have words. You need to speak. You need to sign on the dotted line with your words. Now, in, in earthly contracts, we do it with ink and pen. Uh, or sometimes, you know, people would do it with a fingerprint. But in heavenly transactions, we sign on the dotted line with our words. So faith in and of itself, in your heart, silent faith, quiet faith may be there. You may have that inward conviction. But at some point in time, you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's the corresponding action. Verse 10, he reverses the two. In verse 8, he says, in your mouth and in your heart. Verse 9, he says, in your mouth and in your heart. Verse 10, he says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So again, there's not going to be any salvation until there's corresponding action with the faith. So if you wanted to look at the whole process, and he gives us the entire process in Romans 10. He says, how can you believe in whom you've not heard? Well, you can't. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. So in order to receive something by faith, you have to hear it. You have to know about it. Then you have to believe it. And then you have to confess it or make it yours with your words. Once you do that, then everything changes from that moment forward. Your confession about that thing changes. If, you, if it doesn't, you're going to undermine what you just did. If you think about it like a contract then you know once you sign that contract, things are different. If you, I always bring it back to marriage because we do this verbally, and it's a very clear picture. But if you uh, love someone and you want to marry someone, you don't just have that love in your heart, and, and that's all there is to it. It's expressed by word and action, and you actually go through the marriage ceremony, and you accept that person you go into a covenant with that person with your words you say i do 
We still do that today. We haven't done away with marriage confession. Thank God. Uh, the, you, you, you say, I do. And once you do that, then we recognize, the church recognizes, the, the, the law recognizes that you're married. From that moment forward, your confession changes about your relationship with that person. You have received them as your husband or your wife. So from that moment on, you speak of marriage in the past tense. And if you don't, you're going to cause real problems. You know, if you got married on May 1st and then on May 2nd, somebody says, are you married? Well, I hope so. I think so. I mean, we tried. I'm just not sure. I mean, I, I sure love her. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Well, that's not how you talk about something like that. And yet people do that with the prayer of faith all the time. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. You've got to follow up that point in time where you make that decision. You, you take this thing by faith. You change your confession. Say, well, is it really important? Yes, it is. Faith speaks. And it doesn't speak doubt half the time and then faith the other half of the time. You don't just say when you're with your spouse, we're married. And when you're not with them, you go, I sure hope so. I want to be. Maybe we should do it again. Let's try this over again. Because I just, you know, I said I did and, and I felt it at the time, but I don't have that feeling today. I think maybe we need to go over that again. No, your confession changes uh, with, with that one act, that one act of faith, that covenant. And from that point on, you speak of it consistently. I am married. We were married. I have a spouse. I have a covenant with another person. It happened. It's real. It's mine. I have it. You don't always have to see that person in the flesh to speak that way, and you don't always have to feel it to, to speak that way. It is a done deal. And so our, our faith in God is the same way. You see, well, well I, you know, God knows my heart. I, I, I love that person. I think good thoughts. And this is the difference between faith and positive thinking. We are not talking about positive thinking and a positive confession. The only reason our confession is positive is because we say what God said. And God is very positive. If God was negative about us, we'd still be obligated to say what God said. Aren't you glad that God's not negative? God doesn't call you a loser. He doesn't call you an old sinner. He doesn't call you a failure. He doesn't say things are not going to go well for you and I'm not going to take care of you and I will not protect you. If God said that about us, we would have no uh, recourse but to say the same things. So we don't want to mix up positive thinking with face confession. The reason we speak and say the things we say is not because they're positive for positive sake, but because God said them. And we're agreeing with what God said. I can't help it that God said that I am a saint, that I'm the righteousness of God, that I'm an overcomer, that I'm going to heaven, that he's going to provide for me and protect me and give me. I can't help it. He said it. And if I'm going to really walk with God and, and agree with God, I'm going to have to say what he said. And people listen to people like us and they say, well, you're just very positive. No, I'm just being consistent with what God said. Now, before Jesus came, you know, for Gentiles, it wasn't like this. The Jews had a covenant with God, but we didn't. And so it would have been a, a very, very negative existence. But thank God for the new covenant and all the promises that we have in Christ we're very positive people, but being positive in and of itself, it's like faith without works. Po positive thinking will not get you saved. Faith, quiet faith will not get you saved. Positive thinking will not get you saved. It's faith in Jesus and, and a confession that accepts that offer that he made, that accepts him. That's what gets you saved. So you could just try to be positive for the sake of being positive. And, you know, you could be the most positive person in hell. But that's not really a, a victory as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to be the most positive sinner or the most positive condemned person in the world. I want to be saved. And I want to follow God's plan and God's covenant. And it's very, very positive. However, 
I'm not just trying to be positive. I want to be consistent with what God said in His Word. I hope that helps you. Um, here's an example, Joel 3.10, and we'll have to carry this over into our next session. But in Joel 3.10, it says, Let the weak say, I am strong. And this will help you as we take this scripture and apply it to uh, these principles to this scripture. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Some people have a problem when they see weakness or they see condemnation and guilt. They have a problem saying something that's opposite to what they see and feel. You need to get over that. We are here to agree with God no matter what. If God said it, it's so. Let God be true and every man a liar. Therefore, I can say through the authority of the scriptures that I am strong. You say, well, I don't feel strong. I don't look strong. There's no evidence that I'm strong. Well, I'm not talking about what I see. I'm not talking about what the evidence is. I'm not going to speak that. I'm going to say what God said. God said I'm strong. And there are plenty of promises in the word where we, we see that God promises us strength. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, you can say that. I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why? God told you to do it. And if God told you to do it, then you can do it. So you can see how confession can be woven in to our everyday lifestyle. And yet when you, when you make sure that you're saying what God said and you refuse to say anything contrary to what God said, you can never say, I'm weak again. You can't say, I'm weak and I'm helpless and I'm hopeless and I don't have enough strength. That's just not consistent with what God said. He said, yeah, but I feel that way. Well, if you want to change the things you see and change the way you feel, you have to start saying things and, and agreeing with what God said. You say what God said and it will change the world around you. Um, that's what Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. I'm going to continue this teaching. We got a lot more to get into. Hopefully this is helping you. Uh, just to become aware of our vocabulary, what we're saying, because we really need to watch that area of our life because it really does matter what you say. Well, that's all the time we have. We're going to continue. Don't miss the next episode and get this whole series, uh, whether it's MP3 downloads or the video streaming. Get this series. It'll bless you and help you, and it'll help your, your friends. Everybody needs to understand the importance of confession. God bless you today, and I'll see you next time. Until then, remember this, the good news is so good, the bad news doesn't matter. To order your copy of this series, call our helpline at 918-749-7744, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. If you're enjoying these programs, I'm, I, I'm so thrilled and excited to bring them to you. I've got a lot more to say. We've got so much to share with you, to build you up and to walk with you. And I, I just see us walking together through the landmines that, that life has thrown at us. And, and we're going to run this race together. And if you like what's happening here in the Good News Program, help me get this out to other people. Call our helpline or go to the website and donate, uh, uh, sow a seed today so we can produce more programs for more people in the days to come.